Welcome to Learning CDH, the podcast dedicated to teaching you everything you need to know about Competitive Commander. I'm your host, Matthew, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Eric. And today we're going to be kind of chilling out. We're going to be doing things a little bit different. We don't have like a hard and fast topic of just like a, a lesson we're bringing to you today. So we're going to be sort of just going over both the results of the format, kind of like the hard set in stone, what is happening right now. And then sort of our, like our thoughts on how things are, the decks we're playing and um, just the overall vibe of the community and what's happening. Yeah, sounds pretty good. I'm pretty excited to get started on this today. The the sort of theme right now of CDH is a lot of people sort of scrambling to catch up to what we're going to take a look at is some of the best decks. And I think in a really short amount of time, Brian Koval has changed the way that people look at CDH decks. Him and Bryant Cook as well. It's basically the Eternal Glory podcast has just come in and kind of changed up how people are evaluating cards. One of the big ones, which it's weird because a lot of people were talking about Containment Priest in Brian's list that just won, but he never saw it in the tournament and never got cast. So we don't really know the, the impact of it, but just like the deck building. So we're seeing people looking to win that more long term value game, even in like the hardcore rock side decks. We saw two of those top 16, Punt City 2, and they were both on Narset. Bryant was on Notion Thief as well as like and opposition agent they're both on op agent as these like value engine cards that they don't have enough of a cost to exclude and i think we're seeing a lot of the turbo decks realize that when to me like op agent is like the best grim tutor you're ever going to cast or best predator's grass you're ever going to like it's instant speed it, it basically counters the spell on top of, like your card positive on top of getting the tutor and you get a thing that sits on the board like it does so much and index it yeah, and like decks that create this much mana, like it's not hard to go like underground seed mana crypt, play your Roger, and then you spit up some mana on the board. You don't look like you did you did nothing, and then you pass, and then you, you get somebody with an op agent. Like you get to make mana so much, like your deck is so good at powering out the Ristics and the op agents and even the Notion Thieves that it's and they're like they're safe. Like the the thing, like I've been messing with Rock Side a bit. Like the wheels can whiff so much hard. Like you're never gonna have your op agent just like whiff entirely like like a wheel absolutely can or a jessica's wheel can just as well especially that card can suck sometimes if you are just like land crypt jessica's wheel you can absolutely hit three totally useless cards if you don't have any way to convert that red mana into a different color and so yeah there's definitely been a reevaluation of some of the cards that we're seeing in like turbo decks that are it's like they're going any slower right i think part of the the way i was thinking about it and the way that some people are like increasing your curve like we've seen some decks like tivit have like higher cost things like smothering tithe for instance is kind of coming back and, and like we mentioned with notion thief it doesn't really take you that far off the ground still like you're still low to the ground because the interaction in the format's just so cheap so like you don't really get that punished especially if you aren't heavy on the nas which what we've been talking about is that dedicated nas decks are kind of on the way out and so if you're not worried about getting every little bit of life out of your ad nas going a little bit higher on some of your cmc to give your deck like a little bit more punching power late into the game i don't think is really weakening you because again like it's not like you're you still are losing access to like the swan songs the force of wills the force of negations that keep you able to hit those very low to the ground decks that aren't casting as big of stuff but they're doing it really fast like you still get all of that strength and i don't think there's that much of a weakness for playing through the late game and i think a lot of people are realizing that and that's kind of what we're seeing right now yeah i'll give you a great example so we always talk about like uh, a premier hand in these type of like blue farm decks or rock site would be like land mana crypts uh ristic study and yeah. while that's extremely powerful if you said well i run professional face breaker in blue farm well it might slow your deck down but if you ever turn one a face breaker you don't feel like you're <laughs> slowed down at all yeah you know like i played against yesterday it was like turn one face breaker into turn two crom i didn't feel like slow or turn one face breaker into turn two temna and they're just while it's not ristic study it's ristic study in a different way while also applying pressure on the board and you're not necessarily and then now like people have to respect you mm. even just from like a john john turbo side like i had face breaker into grim hireling you know slower creatures on one and two there's nothing slow about that you know like i have so much mana i I am way on the board. You, you can't just jam your stacks creature into those guys now because I'm just going to pee pew it off. That just allows me to just like play my Corvold. And then now I'm just accruing value. So you better play a board.
board wipe at that point because mm. your chain of vapor is not going to get you through this game. And again, I think that makes cards like, as we saw, Dam, Fire Covenant, Cyclonic Rift should to me, always have been in the decks. March of Swirling yep. Mist, potentially, those type of cards. Just think that, like, you can't just play these, like, I'm just going to rely on just Chain of Vapor and, and like, what's the one that everyone's playing right now? The one that untaps two lands? Snap. It's the Blue Nicolas. <clears throat> Snap, yeah. I got a foil one. I don't know. I totally <laughs> forgot that card. But So, need that ability to pivot and remove and kill things. And I think people have, for the longest time, played too little creature removal. And we've seen, and we're going to, and this actually is going to be a great segue into what we're seeing in trends, the tournament, because some of the boogeyman decks of the format that people like, let's say last year, that were kind of really high on the list that people kind of were like afraid to play of, they've taken a dive. And <clears throat> yet, if you looked on Twitter, people would still start <laughs> talking about these decks all the time and mm. like all oh, these decks are just insane. And that's not to say that this deck isn't good at all. That's not what we're saying because... Because CDH is a lot different than like a 60 card format because the deck could just roll up to the right pod, get really hot, have some good matchups, and it's just crushing. Cards line up very awkwardly sometimes. You don't always see exactly what you need. That's why I like to say this with a little bit of caveat, but as of really the last quarter of the year, we're getting in Q2. We're starting to see some trends and it's going to be interesting to see if these continue and if these decks that basically can only win via their commander or their commander is such a huge focus of the deck and the card quality is like really low in the deck if they can mm -hmm. continue yeah we got access to some really good statistics and i think a lot of that's changing a lot of the the access to information and both the surplus of events that we're having now like the the quantity of info of data we're getting and then also access to it is really going to inform a lot of what's happening this year. And I, th I think it's going to really help people actually figure out what's going on in CDH because a lot of CDH in past years, especially like 2021 20, and before, was really like almost sort of like word of mouth. It's just like, th these are the good cards. You know, I played them at my local event or whatever, and they were good. And like even the bigger tournaments weren't as big and they weren't happening as often. A lot of the, the, the info for CDH was just completely decentralized. Like it'd be in all these different discords. Someone came up with this really good series, Learn to Play, and now people can actually like learn to play the format because like it wasn't like I was really itching to make those videos. It was, uh, hey, this format is actually pretty big and somehow there isn't a good way to learn how to play Blue Farm. Like what the heck is going on? Where's the data on what to do with Blue Farm? Where's the like discussion? Because like people want to CDH to be taken seriously, but there wasn't really that much of an effort for CDH to be serious uh, until recently. Not just with myself with Learn to Play, obviously, but with Eminence specifically doing a lot of stuff. And that's where a lot of this data is coming from, actually, that we're going to be talking about. The Eminence data aggregation, we got access to some info that made my life really easy after I actually did my own kind of less good version of this last night in preparation, but Eminence reached out and um, by the way. yeah, they reached out and got us access to some really helpful information that we're going to be talking about. This will be public, probably not by the time of this, re this releases, but they're looking to have this um, in your, in people's hands within, I think a few weeks or maybe a, a couple months. So that's going to be really awesome once they get it cleaned up, but we got a little sneak peek of it and we're going to be able to talk about that today. So thank you to Eminence. And before we hop into it, I also want to thank our patrons over on Patreon. You like to support this channel. It really helps a lot. Everything that we get over there very directly supports what happens on the Morris cards. And especially a big thank you to big $10 patrons, LF Cruz, Neo Venus, and Def Cat. Thank you so much. And you can also check out my merch which I think is pretty cool. Not a lot of CDH merch out there, and I like to make this stuff for you. Let me know if you like it. Let me know if you don't and what I can make that you would like. And with that out of the way, we can get into the real meat and potatoes of this, where we get to just tear apart some of these decks that aren't as good as people think. Uh <laughs> so for context, we're taking a look specifically at events this year. We want, I know that I wouldn't say that events at the end of last year are outdated already at all. That's not what I'm saying. But we just want to take a look at CDHN 2023. So we're looking at events that have more than 64 entrants. I think that's a pretty good cutoff for events of a decent size. For us, CDH events, even the biggest ones, they're still below 300 people. There are, a lot of them are sub 200. So I think this is pretty relevant uh, size for, for these events. And we're looking at events just this year. So we've had, I think we've had two big Eminence events that were in person with Silicon Dynasty and Plant City 2. We've had three of the Mox Masters events held by playing with power, a few chaos events that we've been online, and then a few other ones this pulls from that I'm honestly not, I, I don't know off the top of my head. 
And unsurprisingly, Blue Farm is number one in top 16s across all these events with 14 top 16s among the 89 entries that the deck has had into these events. So you might hear us talk about conversion rate in this episode a bit. What we're talking about there is the amount of entries that a deck has. So for example, Blue Farm had 89 entries that led to 14 top 16 placements which leads to a 15.73% conversion rate. Again, thank you, Eminence, for doing all of this work for me. I didn't have to do any math. So what that means is 15% of Blue Farm players who signed up for one of these tournaments converted over into top 16. And literally two of those top 16s is Brian Kovold. Think, Wait, Brian won one last year, Yeah, that right? was that was, was uh, Oktoberfest. Yeah, that was last year. Oh, those. that's right. That's right. All right. Sorry, Brian. I was trying to give you a lot of credit there for... Yeah, which he should... If you don't know, Brian Kovold ha- is two for two in CH major tournament. Gone to two of them, one, two of them. That's absolutely insane. Just freaking ridiculous. Uh, as of this recording, the most recent tournament was Pun City 2, which Brian won. And is another reason people are kind of talking about Blue Farm, because that's the deck that brian played so like yeah. quite a bit of changes right like yeah so i really think about it to some different different cards people are like whether it's coming back to or just an overall like approach to the deck versus to what it was like the you know this like crazy kind of trying to like turbo out and then just utilizing the commanders to gain value now it's like more of a turbo like ristic study deck mm-hmm. it's like just trying to use ristic and mystic and esper sentinel and obviously it's commanders to gain all this value put pressure and protect your ad nauseum so versus like trying to like pressure and like use all that nauseum protect ad nauseum early in the game and they rely on the commanders it's being all these hard to deal with threats up front and then it has all these like back window like card scenarios like whether it's ad nauseum intuition obviously underworld breach those type of cards yeah I, I definitely think so we had already seen sort of that shift into blue farm as like a slower controller deck late last year and then we saw brian win with his version of blue farm that he like completely describes as a mid-range control shell um and that he definitely he like piloted that like you you could watch you watched especially the like top four game of okotoberfest we saw like it was not really ever played as like this proactive deck desperately trying to gnaws it was very much like drago set up your engines leave up mana do things on the instep like really solid magic play one of the innovations of that deck was like lavinia as an addition with like cavern of souls what was a big thing where brian and matt sperling realized like hey you got this human in the command zone that you're always looking to cast you have a lot of really powerful humans in grand abolisher and uh Jareth magistrate and opposition agent that you very much don't want to get countered captain. and and esper sentinel ranger captain that you don't want to get countered so implementing it like this where you have like three ish kind of like three silence effects on creatures with ranger captain in Lavinia, Grand Abolisher, that are un- making them uncounterable. Very good. Making your Timna uncounterable, usually not as relevant, but being able to cast Timna easily with a like a rain like an additional rainbow land is nice because Timna is kind of hard to cast for the deck because white black's a little awkward in the early turns. And then we've seen again more experimenting with that where now the most recent list you see is on Loyal Apprentice, Professional Facebreaker as humans added to the deck and Sarah send it and Containment Priest. All humans added to the deck. Like the list is actually called Blue Swarm Four Color Humans by Bosch and Roll. And yeah, you just have these uncounterable humans that are either value engines or hate bears, like really going in on the Timna, especially with Loyal Apprentice and Saris in it. Like these were things we were seeing played more in like the Breeze Thief kind of builds and like years back when they were on like Smothering Tithe and Wheels and Narset. Still not choosing to go that route. But yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of more playing to the board and then just nausing or intuitioning as like a instant speed way to sort of either just like eat up counter magic or like if it resolves, you just win on somebody else's turn, basically. Uh, and just playing this sort of like value generating controlly game plan is kind of what Blue Farm has become about. And it's still like a pretty recent thing that we got there. Also, I think Dofty was a new addition in the most recent thing, not a human. But it's another good card that gets to sit there and hate stuff out. Yeah, so very fortunate when you get four colors to pick from, you know, Mm. you're going to get a lot of humans. And so just utilizing these like really powerful creatures, especially to like, you know, opposition agent having flash of it, you know, can really catch people off guard. I mean, uh, we looked it up. I think opposition agent is the most played black creature in the and in, yeah. in CDH. Uh, big reason why I put it in Corvold if it's 
in literally virtually everything. Why wouldn't it just be in this other deck that generates a ton of mana? It's also just really good. Mm. And oddly enough, like in some weird scenarios, because Oppo's a rogue, Alfie Voidwalker's a rogue, <laughs> Cavern Souls could potentially, if 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 need be, could do it. Like if it, if it got in a weird scenario, really, and it's never the plan, but Cavern Souls being really powerful, like a card I've highly considered in my list because the humans that want to resolve are typically like Ruthless Technomancer, Dosen, Professional Facebreaker, Eternal Witness, they're all humans. So mm. I'm going to look out for her out of my deck pretty soon, hopefully. It really can change the way you look at like your curve because you can do like an early Cavender Souls can one. So like for this deck, you could name it like Pirate and do like turn one Ragavan and turn two Dockside that are both uncounterable, pretty good. But just like in deck, you'll notice like a lot of creature types for a lot of these cards, you just, they just end up lining up pretty well. Not, not necessarily that every deck should be on Cavern. It helps when one of your commanders is a creature type that you care about. But just being able to like curve out Esper Sentinel that's uncounterable, Dran of Magistrate that's uncounterable, Op Age and her face breaker that's uncounterable. Like the curve of cap with Cavern Souls can sometimes just be so crazy on top of really helping fix your mana. Because like we're seeing, this is a 15 creature deck, which is not crazy high, but fairly high for like a Sands Green non stacks list. And so non stacks. Non stacks. It's it's not a stacks deck, but it's it's a four color pile, so there's a bunch of stacks. <laughs> Basically, asymmetrical stack. So it's definitely like a creature deck at this point like and those are your main things and if you're not casting them you're casting like Demna or Krom or Rhystic Study which is you know one of the best spells you can cast period and it really actually fixes your mana for white because uh, the changes in the deck really made a concession to to that specifically like it went to Hollow Fountain over City of Traders because it's trying to play a little bit longer game so the concession of that allowing you to cast your double white cards like pretty easily without inherently putting like taking away because you can still utilize the cavern for your red humans or your you no know, or like the the black creatures or anything like that. So it's it's really good technology and you know, we're gonna always get really good human cards probably in the future. And it just allows for more like space building, like maybe loyal apprentice it doesn't cut the mustard moving forward. Maybe it becomes like something else. Maybe they print a two drop creature that like makes treasures or something like that. You know, mm. it's kind of like a like a treasure it's like a treasure version of what you don't know with the way they're printing cards now, but you know, it just gives you that ability to kind of pivot and also just having the and really probably the most powerful thing about it, it allows you to play the card into a Rhystic Study or a Myst like Mystic Remoras hmm. where people got to gobble up and draw a ton of cards and then you just get to slam Grand Abolisher on un Uncounterable. So better just pretty much have Mind Break Trap at that point because if not, like that card's resolving and the game's probably over. Yeah, but that's really where the power it breaks parity on Rhystic Study. So that's why that card is pretty insane, in my opinion. So yeah, getting to ignore card advantage that your opponents get to build is just really nice because like we've been saying, like building advantage and just like sculpting your hand. That's a lot of what these pile like these mid range piles are doing is just like sculpting a hand full of interaction to but, like stop other people from winning until they can get to their turn where they're like slightly more advantaged to get a piece out like this. You know, a lot of wins are they're going to start with a Grand Abolisher or a silence effect of some sort happening. And yours being uncounterable completely changes the table dynamic of like, what do we do from here? Because at that point, you're just like responding with a silence and then starting the stack war. And then if you don't win that, Grand Abolisher comes down. Doesn't matter anymore. We got there. So yeah, Blue Farm definitely been not surprising that it's here. It has the most entries by quite a lot. Its conversion rate is actually not low, but low-ish for the top 10 or so decks on here that have like... 20 plus entries it's it's kind of like 15 percent. well you don't have any context for this but as we go into it there are some decks that have pretty high conversion rates with 20 plus entries yeah we'll get to those another big one that's like really seen a lot of change lately number two is najila the blade blossom notably not but yeah we've got najila at number two with 10 top 16s 58 out of 58 entries which leads to a 17 percent conversion rate and this is another deck that over the course of like last year, mostly because of legacy players, has uh, really shifted the way that it's designed. There's like you could either be called like in the NBC, no bad cards or uh, like Zane specifics list is like the truth. Mm -hmm. And there's been tons of other players who have innovated on it. I know one of the gentlemen from uh, Sad Nas, they won the chaos event. And then someone else also top four. I think it was Memo top four as yep. well with Najila. And then it's basically really simple play the best cards 
protect your cards, produce tons of mana, and draw cards. It's 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 kind of like this recipe. Najila does really well getting under some of these other decks because Najila can come down pretty early. You just start pressuring the board, or again, it does the same thing. It plays all these really powerful cards, and then just specifically off this last event in Punt City 2, the list that went X1 during the Swiss was the most winning deck there in terms of the Swiss rounds. They were on Opposition Agent. Again, playing a card like Opposition Agent, what you look at it, if you're thinking about this Turbo Najila list, it's not really on brand, but it's just such a powerful card. It allows you to play the game on a different axis. And that's why it comes up a lot in all these decks. You know, you get to see it still running all the fun Najila stuff, the mana dorks, the combos with like Derevi, that type of stuff. I'm personally a big fan of Grim Hireling in this deck, just because again, it allows the deck to do something completely different, whether it's a combo piece, it generates mana, it also clears away stacks creatures, and then obviously it's on Draineth Magistrate as well. But yeah, the legacy players and just you know, kind of those players generally took with it, they ran with it, and then it's just been innovated more by the community. It's a great choice. It's really hard to go wrong with a commander that is basically a Jewel Lotus on turn one, playing Ristic Mystic, Esper Sentinel, Nauseam, and Underworld Breach, and having access to all five colors. And while green might be on the lower end of some people's power range, as you can, we're going to test. The Najila plays a little bit of green cards, and we'll talk about another deck. Does play quite a bit more green cards coming up, but you know, it gets the best of the green cards. It gets the Elvish Spirit Guide, the Tender Wall, the Worldly Tutor, the Veil of Summer, those kind of cards. Especially with the creature tutors that are like to the battlefield, like Eldritch Evolution. This list not opting for Neoform, it looks like. Probably because you don't, yeah, you just don't have a lot of two drops you're looking to. Because typically you're either trying to turn a one drop into like a Derevi or potentially maybe like an op agent or a ranger captain. But these cards just giving you the flexibility with Eldritch Evolution, you do that on a one drop, you could be grabbing Derevi to combo. You could be grabbing Granibosh here because you have everything you need. Just like the, the flexibility of some of the green cards to get you exactly what you need straight to the battlefield before people know it is obviously going to be really powerful. And again, this is another list like Blue Farm that a lot of its power, I think, is in its ability to pivot. This is a deck that's running, you know, like we were mentioned, sort of like ritual effects, like your Red of Flames, your Tender Walls, your Spirit Guides. But it is definitely a deck that is here for the long game. If a Najila gets on the board, kind of one of the strengths of it is it's a turn one play very often because I don't know how, but every Najila player has like turn one Najila. Every, it's always like Jeweled Lotus and like a Mystic or more or Esper Sentinel. And having the option for that is insane. Like it's not easy in Blue Farm to cast a turn one Timna and a one drop creature. It's pretty difficult, actually. Najila, not really a problem. Just land, Jeweled Lotus, boom, you got it. And having that like piece that you can play the like protect the queen game plan that will just, if people stop casting spells, it will just kill you very quickly. It's just really strong to have in a shell that can also pretty explosively do something like, you know, Dockside into Adnaz or just get your a little bit of mana up and uh, Culling Ritual and do what you want. Get rid of the hate pieces. Play for the long game with Grim Hireling. That's also one card combo with your commander. Like this is such a great example of like a layered deck like it gets to do everything especially now that they're on underworld breach more often than not just getting access to what, probably the best win con in the game you just can't really go wrong with these newer builds of Najila. Yeah, it's, it's just they're doing really they're doing a lot of good technology and they're going to keep playing around, you know, tournaments ago it was Archivist of Agma as one of those kind of flex creature spots. This one was like opposition agent. I was going to say, like like you said, it, it pivots very well. It also just has the plan of buffing stuff too. like it doesn't have to turn to Najila. I mean, obviously it does. It wants to You know if it has the oppo, the oppo is going to make people respect it. So if you don't have the mana to like go Najila protect, you could just like leave up three people not playing into the opposition agent basically you're buying tempo back and then you just allow to play like a land and then you're najila with protection uh, i did want to point out there was at least i thought this was kind of interesting like najila has almost and completely kind of pivoted to that um no bad cards whatever you want to call it version we did at least see one top 16 and silicon dynasty with a kind of old school pongo style 
uh, Najila deck running Chatterfang and like what is it, 27 creatures opting for cards like Sylvan Library and Wild Growth and Carpet of Flowers instead of like the Breach line. Also running Braids, Arisen Nightmare. That's a kind of interesting one. You don't typically see that, but lets you take advantage of your tokens. Kind of like a, the same deal as like different axis, but like what Infernal Plunge is there for, taking advantage of those warriors you have laying around. But yeah, so Najila is still a deck that can work in a lot of different ways. Don't know if we saw a stacks deck pop up for Najila this year in a top 16, but it's another one that it just gets to do that thing. You got five colors, you got a lot of options, and Najila loves a board state where nothing's happening because that's just a win waiting to happen. So yeah, definitely a commander to watch out for. You kind of didn't need us to tell you that, but it has been interesting because we did sort of see like early last year and the year before where Najila was kind of losing her shine a little bit, whereas in previous years, it was just like, this is the best commander period. We're seeing it sort of come back to that higher status. Yeah, next we are looking at Roos and Thrasios. This is one probably with the most splits. It's it's mostly Dawn Waker. Um, that's a pretty popular one. But there is a little bit of Wild Pile as well. And I think at least a Blue Pot or two. Because it is a, a sort of versatile deck, though it, it tends to do a lot of the same things. It's very heavy on the creature tutors. Like to use Thrasios to win with your Seaborn Muse. You may have heard in January-ish a lot of complaints about Thrasios Seaborn Muse in tournaments. And that's because by my count, there were like nine or 10 Thrasios decks in top 16s like within days apart with Chaos 6 and the Mox Masters in January. There's an absolute glut of, of that happening. That's an interaction. It's, it's interesting because like part of that is just like, you know, people complaining, but like as we see like more people are having experience in in tournament instead of just casual cdh things that eat up the clock are more relevant and so like those sort of play patterns i don't think it's anything we're gonna have to address really but when those aren't being executed very well like you you hear it come up that there was a lot of talk on twitter about really slow play or borderline slow play with thrasios activations or people were really wishy-washy and what they were going for but yeah bruce thrasios probably so notably not a deck that can run ad nauseum so not something you think of as having the same explosive pivot plan like a blue farmer and agila deck um you don't really have access to rituals barring dockside but one of those decks that just consistently does what it does you're kind of under the radar in the early game it's like the political players deck because they are just going to be like oh i'm just you know mana dork here thrasios there i'm chilling trying to get value <laughs> yeah just generally they they really feed on that mid-range grindy thing because they do it better than a lot of decks do so we see it also, along with Njila, had 10 top 16 placements, but less entries, only 43 entries, giving it a 23% conversion rate. So quite a bit higher, actually, than Blue Farm or Najila with still a pretty relevant amount of entries. So this is our first one, I think, this high up without a tournament win so far this year. But a lot of top 16 placements and I think a few top four placements as well because it just does the tournament environment very well i feel like it gets to play that political game gets to grind super hard and it has i, I think the thing holding this back deck back for me is that it it has compact ish win cons but they're not as compact as like doesn't have anything quite as tight as thoracle console or um as like self building as breach most of the time a, a lot of decks are still not looking to run breach but it just does well in, in these tournament settings it, it's it's one of these really proven decks right now so i think this deck is pretty interesting just for the fact of it gained a lot of traction obviously from the creators of the deck who were playing it and everything and they did really well with it but these creature decks that we're seeing that are like the green decks doing well they were doing well and i think now that people are playing like more cyclonic rift based like removal like where it's like cyclonic rift and fire covenant those type of cards we might see a pivot in the future the deck's still very good it, it's also hard for me to like play a red deck without underworld breach mm -hmm. it's the most powerful thing red can do i like the deck i think it's really i mean it's super strong like it's super strong but like it's really honestly and i'm gonna smile might be wrong i think it's a secret commander cannon deck i think it's really yeah. a cannon deck oh you know, it gets to do if it gets to stick a cannon cannon just is really like so explosive in the deck and what the deck can do it makes your dockside treasures double it obviously has the basalt monolith combo in there it has zert of the dawn waker that does some crazy stuff with basalt monolith and whatnot but and depending on what builds they might be on the devoted druid line as well the swift reconfiguration you know i haven't really dived into the recent list because i haven't really like 
played with the deck as of like the last three months i haven't really and then i just kind of click on them to see like oh yeah it looks pretty similar to like what everyone's already been playing but it's always good to take a deep dive and look and try to see like if there are new innovations what people are playing is there any new pivot lines in this list you know or is it just kind of all the same what it's kind of been like so that's something that's pretty interesting to see um i'm pretty sure that i mean this deck's pretty much supplanted like the other like Stands black Thrasios list, right? Like the is it uh, Akiri? Oh, I don't I, the 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 red white two drop. Yeah, I think there were a couple Thrasios Akiris. It's not, and it's pretty far down, so I don't think we're gonna touch on it. Pretty well, like this is the combo you're gonna use, and and mostly again, you don't really if if you're not familiar with the deck, you don't care about Bruce too much but uh neoforming bruce into a seaborn muse will win you the game and so that's like a lot of neoforming or eldritch revolution in your bruce also just the deck is actually just pretty good at blocking timna no one is attacking you when bruce is up and thrasios is a one three which tends to do pretty well we'll also just bump into timnas i personally think because looking at the list even the more recent ones they're basically card they're very close card for card just like comedians version on the database i think that there is a lot of room for this deck to have different builds and adapt we, we mentioned there's things like wild pile and and blue pod that are different variants with the same commander pair but i think even the you know sort of the dawn waker or basalt monolith focused versions of the deck have room to maybe change up the the, the game plan we might see them move to underworld breach kind of like the Najil pilots eventually did i've been testing it with i tested it with breach and i thought it did okay i've been trying like bigger value engines like smothering tithe which always feels great actually when i've been playing it recently i think there's room to talk about what's in it because like i think a lot of the discussion for this deck is like card quality and i don't think like is Emil and zerda actually really that high a card like is that really higher card quality than breach and intuition like is it wargate is wargate really better than intuition i don't think it is also you can tell if it's an well, ian list because he's wargate. the only player in the world well, not really but if it has delay, it came from Ian. <laughs> Just one thing I've noticed, he's really high on delay. Which again, this, the strength of what this deck does is that creatures typically are harder to, to counter, but we are seeing people like, you know, if we're going to continue to see decks become creature, you know, even more and more creature heavy, that might not be the case if this deck doesn't look to adapt to um, more creature hate that we see, like cards like Damn that got played in Brian's list that he said, absolutely overperformed then it, it could be trouble because if you can't keep dorks on the board this deck can struggle to keep an advantage going doesn't run that many artifacts also i wouldn't be shocked to see an uptick in toxic deluge too on the yeah. decks that don't like decks that don't necessarily care about their board state like that are like maybe the turbo decks because like the turbo decks that don't have like creatures on the board typically toxic deluge would probably be a huge is a huge pickup for them because you're going to typically spend less life on the deluge than you would a fire covenant and you're going to be able to just to kind of like three mana clear the board and then just kind of do your thing so it's going to be like it's going to break the stat like a stack smear if it's like creature based and stuff so we start seeing and you know if you're like deluge for two against the deluge for three against this deck it like pretty much wipes the whole deck out yeah one thing one and strength three. The, this deck does have is it's one of the few really top tier decks that gets to run like rest in peace and um solace jailer without shutting off anything it does i think we've seen any decks with solace jailer yet but that is still a pretty recent release that is a really good way to make all the underworld breach players at the table very unhappy especially rest in peace if they don't have counter for it there is a pretty decent chance you actually just exile something on etb that you know they were wanting to use but not being able to run like like this deck just wants black so bad like this deck would love opposition agent so much it would i think it would like a notion thief like there's a lot of things i think it would like clearly it is doing well still i kind of think that there's room to improve the list i saw recently who was it was talking about this might have been brian or bryant or someone on twitter was saying a deck you really want to be able to take the win if people give it to you. Like if there's a stack war and all the interaction is blown, you know, they pass to you and you want to really want to be able to win. And I think this deck kind of struggles to force a win. You know, you don't have access to black tutors. You don't have access to ad nauseum. So like building a win con, it kind of takes because when you're in sans black, you kind of have to tutor for tutor and it just takes you a little bit to get going. So I think that's one thing I haven't liked about this list. And the cool thing with like secret commander cannon versus actual cannon is cannon just is one basalt monolith away from winning at almost any given point you don't really have to do a lot of jumping through hoops with it so i think that's one thing that 
I don't like about the deck as much, but it also is just like a stable deck. It mulligans very well. Yeah, so it mulligans know. very well. And I don't know. I, so I'm I'm more I err on the side of the like the blue evolution piles. Like I really do like that because they can just win the game. Like it's not reliant on a card like Basalt Monolith. Like it yeah. has just other cards <clears throat> that kind of interact fairly well with the deck. And obviously, like Domwicker Thrasios. Also, it's got a way sweeter name, right? Like oh, it sounds awesome. No. <laughs> blue evolution and John Waker Thrasios. I mean, it's just it's night and day different. Just I just like I like having cards like Birthing Pod or you know cards that are actually quite good at layering and and just kind of eating up the board state. I was a pretty big fan of I think um, Spleen last year was running a form of Blue Evolution and it looked really good on camera and stuff. And mm. it's just a super solid deck. I think the colors just allow you to be really customizable based on what you think's gonna you're gonna be facing against. And so that you know take that with a grain of salt you know we're we're, we're just a bunch of no buys with no tournament result <laughs> I'd, so. i also think it might be worth noting to me that one thing like this the deck in its colors they kind of encourage you to play it the way that it's meant to be played i feel like the way the list is built because like i think a blue farm pilot could take blue farm into a game and keep a hand that looks like a turbo hand and just totally misplay and into early interaction. Whereas like this deck is very slow and steady controlly, and you're not too likely to keep like a bait hand that's just like all in on a turn two win. And it's why I think like you look at like Omnath, which has these same colors, those decks tend to be a little bit more all in and because they don't have like great value generation in the command zone and i think that that helps here because it keeps you responsible a bit because it there's nothing too it irresponsible yeah you, you don't have just like cards to blow you're not going to bring yourself down in card advantage keeps you honest i think and i think that is relevant when you're looking at like a large number of results from players of all st sort of experience levels especially when you're looking at the the biggest decks like people who are new are picking up blue farm and taking it to a tournament with you know less than 10 games under their belt so you're going to have people that come into the games with varying levels of experience and like i think that can be a factor of like how intuitive the deck is and how well it aligns with its game plan on like the average hand like you're pretty well on like the slow and steady game plan when you're picking up thrasios bruce and that tends to to do pretty well especially if you're making good decisions with your interaction yeah i, I agree with that quite a bit that's actually a very uh very good observation Okay, so at number four, this is a, an interesting one. So of the decks that have, to me, like at, at the number of entries that we're looking at, 20 seems like a good cutoff for like a high enough sample size to where the, the conversion rate, I think to me is relevant at, at that point. And this is the deck that actually has the highest rate of those lists. So it got nine top 16s out of 31 entries, leading to a 29% conversion rate, which is pretty like that's double blue farm like it is you know almost a third of the number of entries but that's a really high conversion rate at what i would consider still a pretty relevant number so tivit was sort of I, I guess you'd say put on the map last year with comedian playing it to a win and i believe one of the mox masters events this is a deck that it's very much part of the like esper value engine mid-range game plan you're running your usual suspects that we've been talking about. You're running your Esper Sentinels, your Dranath Magistrate, your Op Agents, Ranger Captain, Historical Combo, Archivist of Ogma is more likely to show up here. As well as like Phantasmal Image, since you don't have access to Dockside, you know, bring Dockside at home. This is one of the few lists that we're seeing really take advantage of Displacer Kitten because Tivit has a pretty crazy ETP if you get to continually use it and then for the most part pretty typical esper stuff this is very much a controlly kind of shell you have a six mana commander that's one of your main win cons so you kind of got to take it a little bit slower the main win con that's like unique to this that you're not going to see in other decks is time sieve that can loop with tivit to give you infinite or close enough to infinite turns depending on the board state to draw your you know draw most of your cards get a bunch of mana until you can do like a thoracal win this has been i feel like a little overlooked like when you look at the numbers how many top 16s it gets and the conversion rate like all of its numbers are really good like it seems like tivit is one of the highest performers in the format right now and to me a lot of that is because one people look at a six mana commander and they don't take it seriously really i mean look at niv sorry shauna but like people don't take niv seriously i love niv but people don't take him seriously tivit's a lot easier to cast than niv and in way better colors but still and you're just going bigger than a lot of the decks tivit is the craziest 
Timna that you could <laughs> you could ever hope to cast coming down immediately making you treasures and a bunch of clues and you just get to go lean more into that like bigger game plan so like some of the decks are on Nas, some of them aren't some are on Hullbreaker horror um you're running cards like toxic deluge and mnemonic betrayal especially is really good as just like a one card win con in the late game you get to run cards like dam just you don't really have that many creatures so you can really hate them out you don't have a lot that you're using your life total for so you can just dump it into toxic deluge it's not like you have to spend that much life on a deluge anyways and then you have uh, one card win cons and a whole bunch of tutors and you get to run cards like Smothering Tithe, which work really well with your commander. Some decks are on like Counterbalance and Sensei's Top. There's just like a lot that this deck gets to do and you get to just kind of run good stuff without the red. And then you have like the biggest value engine in the zone of anybody at the table most of the time. There's very few to me like meta buster decks out there i think there's decks that take advantage of the meta and where this deck to me falls in outside of just being another value-based deck it gets to run cards like curse totem and graph digger's cage which i don't know if you've ever played against graph digger's cage being like underworld breach deck or a deck that's trying to like creatures into play like that's not from your hand for one mana that card is extremely powerful there's not a lot of decks that get to take advantage of this to me arguably one of the most powerful stacks pieces in the game and this deck does this pretty well um like for example like one of these lists i'm looking at uh it's called it's like the cat and sphinx list that's like one of the three win lists recently right under ian's list it's not on yagmoth's will or anything so it's not really trying to play out of it's not trying to play out of the graveyard or anything like that and it basically if it gets to do its thing it can lock you up also it's one of the few decks that has resi more resilient counter spells for the creatures it plays delay it plays mana drain those type of cards it's going to take advantage of that stuff and it has just quite a bit it's on hydro blast as well uh, at least this list is so it's one of those decks that for a non-red deck like a Demir Plus, it's pretty good. Like, I would honestly say it's probably better than advertised. Um, and it just, like you said, has these grind engines that we've talked about, the usual suspects. It has Urza Lord High Otter Fester. It just gets to also turn, like, its artifacts into mana. Just gets to value out with Urza. It's pretty interesting. I don't know if how, like, I'd have to, like, talk to people who play that, like, how good Urza actually is in the list. Sure, it's good. I don't know. I, I, I would be, I'd be silly to sit here and say whether it's good or not. One one of the things, though, I will say that about the deck is having a commander. I don't want to say it's unplayable. If it didn't have ward, I think it would be pretty unplayable. Oh, the ward is like, super relevant on this thing. Yeah, basically says hexproof. Yeah, no. Ward three is huge. Ward three is huge because of it being blue. It would, you would think, oh, it's susceptible to pyro red elemental blast. Mm -hmm. That ward three completely changes the dynamics of that commander, and that's what allows that you know commander to be really good. Also, too, the fact that it's obviously on cyclonic rift, it's on damned as well. So. I mean, it, it's a really powerful deck. I think you have to respect it. I think you have to understand what the deck does, how it has the ability to, you know, again, has this mid-range plan, but can just blink out an eye, Thoughts is Oracle, Demonic Consultation. It's Demir. Like, hmm. how bad can Demir really be? Yeah, I I like to, I've described Graph Digger's Cage as the most powerful card in the format that most people can't run. It's so strong that it makes the super OP stuff, you can't do it. And so like almost every deck, it's just not even a consideration. Like all the decks we talked about, Najila, one, the, you know, the more turbo versions, they don't want to have to deal with no breach. The more mid range versions, they don't want to have to deal with no creature tutors. Blue farm, it basically, that is a breach deck. I mean, it, that deck's winning through breach like 90 games out of 100, something like that. Dawn Waker is one of the creature tutoringest decks that you're going to see. Like that is its game plan very much. Shutting that off pretty big. Again, there's a lot of decks that they do one or the other. They like Blue Farm doesn't have creature tutors. It doesn't care about that part, but it cares very much about the graveyard. There's a lot of decks that care about one half of this. And so you just can't really run it. Being able to, to run things that just shut off graveyards uh this list isn't on rest in peace that is something you could run because again you don't care about the graveyard too much and playing esper value engines i mean i've made entire videos complaining about how op they are it's going to be good there's, there's not too much else to say and also one card win cons with your commander that are tutorable in your colors also pretty strong so now we're going to talk about a deck that has this weird of hate behind it and i don't know i don't know where it originally started from it's just to me it's really it's really 
more comedical, just like watching things unfold on Twitter, but because Twitter's ridiculous. But anyways, is Rogsai. So Rogsai, if you don't know what Rogsai is, it's a turbo anosium list. It's Grixis. It utilizes Silas Wren as basically blue and black for to combo with uh, Rog. So you get like, you know, your blue and black. So Rog cuts on all these like free cards, like Fierce Guardianship, Deflecting Swat, and... um Deadly Rollick also is probably the best Mox Amber deck in the format, like it and like it and Kennen. Hmm. But it just allows you to basically have a Mox Ruby like in your deck, which is insane. That card is really good in the decks that can play it. Rog Size is a pretty interesting thing because as you alluded to earlier, it was like unless somebody did the work like you did and look at the data and actually went back and we've talked about this, especially just chatting back and forth, and like somebody would say something like, Well, that deck's terrible, it doesn't win. But that deck doesn't do well. It doesn't win. And you actually go back and you start looking at the results and you're like, wait a minute, this deck is like in almost every top 16. Like what? Mm. I don't understand like where this is coming from. Same with like kind of how Blue Farm was like Blue Farm doesn't do well. And then you go back and Blue Farm's literally been farming the format the last year (laughs) plus. So it's a little bit different. It finally had its wins. I don't think people understand like winning a tournament and and, and I'm going to go like mild side tangent here, but like winning a tournament is really, really hard to do. No matter what deck you're on, like there's so many factors that go in. Like Brian Koval, who's a great player, you know, won this last event. Brian Koval got in at 16th. We're a tiebreaker from not making it. Would we really think less of Brian Koval if they didn't top 16? No, because the deck still performed the same results that it did. Get two into inherently a top 16. So I think there's a lot of minutia that goes into like looking at these results and stuff. Like one of the Tibet decks that were that I just looked at, it had like three wins. It was a budget deck. It was a $150 CDH tournament budget. So I'm not going to include that into the CDH uh, algorithm there. So we're gonna we're just gonna exclude that. But the one thing that we're really interested in on Rogsai is kind of breaks the mold of what people are thinking that it's a glass cannon it, it can't stay in the game and there's been a lot of people innovating on it so it's not just brian cook it's basically the whole epic storm team and natix has the list on the deck database but it was like the peer into the abyss variant and it was apparently the more to me glass cannon version mm. and brian cook's version because brian cook's version does a really great job of taking advantage of like earn equity and the ability to really push the pace on what the deck can do and it really kind of eats up a lot of time off the slot by casting these wheels earlier than traditional decks but let's take a quick look actually at rogsai so rogsai is in fifth it has eight top 16s there's 38 entries with a 21.05 percent conversion rate which is higher than Krom, which is higher than Najila. And it's pretty close to Bruce Tarl. And if you look at the Bruce Tarl Thrasios list, you would probably go, you know, oh, wow, that, that you know, that list is, uh, you know, you, you see it, you like, you inherently think that deck always top 16. Well, Rock'sai is literally right there. You know, it has, what, five less entries and two less top 16s. So it's right there in my book. Like, it's a, it's a pretty impressive, like, overall for a deck that supposedly is glass cannon. And I think it's really come through the innovations lately. It's allowed it to change whether it was the Bolas of Citadel version, which allowed it to play a little bit different longer game. Then even recently, Bryant made an evolution of his current turbo list, which was to cut the transmute artifact in the Bolas of Citadel and go into just the good creatures like the opposition agent notion thief and the narset parter avails which gives you a proactive and very reactive game plan at the same time one i think it's worth saying that every cdh deck is like hard to pilot properly to begin with right this is just like a complicated Mm -hmm. format most eternal formats are going to kind of be like this especially when you have to combo and there's three players going crazy rock side to me stands out as even like cheating and looking ahead on the whole top 10 i think one of the harder decks to pilot and it kind of like the opposite of bruce tarl you can look at those hands you can get so baited into rock side hands if, if you really aren't just like a really diligent pilot who knows what you need to go for who's like really aware of seat position you can look at rock side and think like oh this is just this is the glass cannon meme that we're talking about but i don't really think it is and again it's like i think the decks that are seeing the most experimentation so you know you have like we mentioned got brian who's been and, and matt sperling who have been like experimenting with blue farm and improving on it and then you have like uh the drakes and the uh zanes with Najila. 
I think Zane also experimenting with Rock'Sai. These sort of decks, I think, are going to be the ones that keep rising. And I wouldn't be surprised if someone's not experimenting with like Bruce Rastis, like I was talking about, where we see it kind of fall behind. Because I just think, especially with the amount of tournaments and again, like with the amount of data, you need to like throw away preconceived notions of the format because to be honest, people weren't, and even still to some extent, like people aren't taking the format that seriously with the decks they're submitting and they aren't like trying to break things. And if you don't have a lot of people trying to break things, like the whole game can just stagnate. And I think decks like Rogsire are showing like, hey, you can do it. Most recently we had, I think it was what, uh, Bryant Cook and Alana, top 16, the same tournament with decks that were like very slightly different, like three cards different with Rock's Eye. Yeah, three cards and different. they're both like, again, making these changes for like the longer game. They're not just like, it's not even the same Rock's Eye as it was like a month ago. It may seem like small changes, but like it's a different philosophy that goes in when you have a card like Notion Thief is going into the deck. Yeah. Then Bolas of Citadel, Transmute Artifact, like that's a completely different type of thing you're trying to address. I know Brian has said he thinks part of it is just his personality is a lot of the hate that Rockside's got, but he's just a really passionate dude. And he like, again, like a lot of people I think should be, should be like that is that he just was like, well, why are we doing this? Is it actually the best thing we can do? And it's not like if you think, you know, something is right, it doesn't mean that you're wrong, like you're dumb and you're wrong for thinking that you're not right. It's just like, we're got to be iterating. Like this is a format that is clearly in my mind, even though we have like a lot of consistent results, it's not a solved format. And I don't think this top 10 is like the, you know, you give a, a super AI access to this format. It, this is the real top 10 that it would spit out there's definitely still a lot of testing and stuff to do and just like you know i wouldn't have I thought tivit would be on here i know uh eric hates tivit and he probably wouldn't have thought it would be, <laughs> would be on here too i just I, I just i don't know i just the reason why i don't like tivit is because it's you know it gets to play like really good cards that's probably why <laughs> it's mm, yeah. just the better corvold really honestly because it has access to blue and white but uh, to go back to rock i think when you look at the pilots of rock you know when you have you know bryant cook popped in and that was his like first like eminence event i believe to play that list but mm -hmm. the the pilot that um outside of zane because zane is known for playing rock side quite a bit uh is alana and when someone as good as alana plays rock side and switches from blue farm to rock side for the last few events that really gives me cause to pause because alana's like to me easily one of the best players out there they're just literally like went away from like top four and you know mm. i'd like to me that doesn't discredit alana as a player at all because alana is a phenomenal player like just consistently top six machine i know comedian gets a lot of praise for you know top 16 top fouring and you know to me alana's just right there you know mm. it's 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 a decision tree away from, from something like that so that's just one of those things when you look at the players and then surprisingly too like you've got not sure uh when ashani topped but ashani uh went four Four wins, zero losses, and one draw with Rogsai. You no, know? and mm. when you start looking at decks, decks also get skewed a little bit because decks that typically aren't like if they're not like super staxy or have access to blue, they're not going to be able to draw the game out. Decks that too that you know you might have three three wins and two because they and then and they might have some draws or they might have like two two and one or like you know whatever because they have the equity to draw the game out if they can't win the game. There's gonna there's like a next to me a next level layer of all the data that's on here that we got and i know this is kind of like primal in terms of the data that we have and when you start looking into the decks like you take something like jun dargo jun dargo is not gonna like draw the game out that's something to kind of take into it. and rock side can kind of do it can either win or it can draw the game out because it is in blue and it has it's very hyper mana efficient and the cards that we mentioned allow the deck to play on a kind of again a different like pivot point so it's still this hyper fast list but it still has like the super high rolls of like turn one oppo agent or be able to play like narset you know protect the narset or just narset you know dig to you know, get into whatever you need to get more counters or you know dig into your ad nauseum so new innovations on rock side really just shows the deck's ability to adapt because if you really look at how where the deck started the fanatics is edb list to where it's at now i mean it's not like five cards difference in card it's 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 quite a bit of cards difference and the philosophy of the thing the deck is too completely different so it's something to look at too it's not just like oh hey i made three card changes therefore the deck's completely different it's also the philosophy and the way you play the game because we do play in a in a game with you know high density tutors and draw engines so you're going to see these cards probably a little bit more often than you think 
Mm -hmm. Any deck that can just like make the decision of like, hey, am I in a position where it's safe to win? Okay, tutor for Underworld Breach. Or am I not in a position to do that? Okay, tutor for Ristic Study. Like any deck that has the option to do that, I think is just going to be good in general. Being able to like run Ristic Study gives you late game potential or mystic remora and i think it's also like it is relevant over the course of a tournament to think about what your commanders add to the game but also like this is a this is a heavy Dranith magistrate format that we're in right now a lot of times like you're you're kind of relying on the 98 or the 99 to do a lot of the heavy lifting and being able to get like under Dranith, like Rockside can do and also just like and just have a good 98 that's really powerful i think is relevant and, and like Looking at the commanders and like deciding like, oh, that's a glass cannon deck just based off of that or that's a whatever deck doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like we mentioned, Bruce Thrasios, this isn't really listed as like this isn't Dawn Waker. There were a significant amount, like three to five decks that aren't Dawn on Dawn Waker that are under the same name of Bruce Thrasios on here. I don't have access to the stats to split it up by archetype. That's it's just something to keep in mind that a deck isn't exactly its commander, like we mentioned with Najila. Rock size just had a lot of innovating and experimenting with very good pilots, which is another thing. Don't take this list as necessarily a tier list because again, like if one of these very strong pilots just decide, oh, you know, instead I want to play Kenrith or whatever, uh Anala or Tassigur, like if they were dedicated to that deck. You probably see those decks up higher as well. Like you have people who want to put in the work and are very proficient pilots. They're going to tend to perform well. And then also, you know, when you have people who are good brewers and they tend to be gravitating towards certain decks, then maybe you can take that as a sign. Like, okay, maybe there's something really strong going on here. Yeah. And I think too, that comes from all oh, CDH has been around for a little while. I still think it's very in its emphasis stage where there's not a lot of eyes on it. Mm -hmm. There's just this kind of very niche of a niche community that's doing a ton of the brewing. And if X person popularizes a deck and deck's good, more eyes are on that deck, more people are going to inherently pick it up uh, versus like if somebody like without getting into the specifics, we'll take the Kalia deck that won uh, Mox Masters. Mm hmm. The Sands Blue Mardu deck. It's not even a typical Mardu commander pairing, or it's just one. And that deck was able to win. Maybe Kalia really is good and it plays really well into this format. And not enough people want to pick it up because what is it? It's a creature that attacks and puts in something for free. It's uh it's effectively cheating on mana while it's not like Winota or anything like that. It's also still what is it? It's a it's like a turbo Nas, Bolsa Citadel, those type of cards as well. I don't think that deck inherently is in the same power level as some of these other decks. It doesn't make that deck any less viable. Mm. It's again, it's not like uh, a lot of people picking that deck up and playing it. So if that deck had like, you know, you know, some of these top players that we talked about dedicated, really working on innovating the deck, I could put that deck in a completely different light. So I, I think that's, we've seen that before. We've seen that true with 60 card formats. And it only typically takes is like finally one person to figure out like back in the day, you would see like the pro tour really set the meta for worlds. Mm. So like back in the day, like the pro tour would come out with decks and it could be a team that came out with like this particular deck. All five people in the team are playing the deck. The deck comes and crushes. And now worlds is like new meta is completely like resculpted based on that. Well, everybody else could have been playing this other deck where it had like 20, 30 pilots or whatever. Pretty interesting to see. Um, I think the more CDH grows, I think you get to see more eyes on because ultimately it's this is still just commander, right? Like people have their pet decks. Like I have my pet deck. Even though like I would easily recognize Blue Farm as a better deck than the deck I currently play, I really enjoy playing what I play and trying to work the puzzle of can I maximize this deck efficiency for what it does? Do I even have the tools to do it? Even though I know it doesn't have access to Blue, you know, as a power level scaling effect so you know do i just like fold up ship and just go start playing blue farm i don't know I, we're gonna find <laughs> out here pretty soon <laughs> got some tournaments on the way but that's, that's the one thing i'd like to take a caveat we're still in the very beginning of the stage but we are seeing trends we are seeing decks that do well you know it's pretty hard to say you know now we're not we're not really seeing like as of this year specifically just within the top five decks we talked about they're all just high quality decks they're all high quality card level decks Mm. not like a lot of filler in these decks there's no infernal plunges in these lists hardly you know what i mean like they're just all really good cards and on an unrelated note next is kenan and i think kenan's just kind of had a surge lately 
Yeah. It really has. Again, I think this is kind of like out of just the top six. Let's see, what is top six? So one, two, three. This just should be like 50% like comedian. Well, I mean, just in terms of influences. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, next, yeah. yeah. So like, Kenan, Tivit, you know, comedian influencing Arles. on like on Waker, Tivit, and Kenan. So we're getting to see like Kenan. Kenan's just really did well previously, not in this last tournament but the tournaments beforehand because it gets under Dranith magistrate very well it's a creature deck that utilizes you know the weaker color green to really power through because there wasn't a ton of creature removal in the format and ken is just a really great deck that gets to utilize mana it has basalt monolith combo it gets to put in these like really kind of hard to deal with creatures like hullbreaker horror void winner has access to seaborn muse of course because it's it is secret commander thrasios and then it just plays the good draw engines, good counter spells, that type of stuff. And it just generates a ton of mana. But as we saw, when people dedicate more creature removal to the format, these decks that rely on specifically their commanders or whether they're just more respected, like Winona and Kennen, they just kind of fell off a little bit. Yeah, I think some of Kennen's success is it kind of does what we talked about where it can be it can play that like slower game where it just builds advantage i mean you're in blue you don't have access to like the white advantage engines you may have noticed like the top four decks all have white in them they all have azorius because those have like the best engines right now and then black is like right there as well you get access to like stuff like sylvan library and green which people debate about, <laughs> about if that's good enough but um it kind of does a really good job of being like explosive in how it develops but it develops things that aren't it's not like trying to jam a win as fast as possible and rarely having protection like it's just jamming really high impact powerful cards it's getting them way ahead of schedule and it can just like do it behind things it sets up like Ristics and Mystics that draw them cards or, you know, it can be something like a Consecrated Sphinx, which is really hard to deal with or like some of them are on stuff like Perplexing Chimera, which can be a really interesting thing to get on the board. Like it gets to run a lot of things. It's dipping more into the like questionable card quality because there are things you're not necessarily looking to hard cast or um, might be a little rough in opening hands where you're mulligan more aggressively. But yeah, just having... This like explosive, more or less mana doubling effect in the zone on such a cheap commander and who also has like an outlet for his mana doubling. Kind of ridiculous. Yeah, Kenan, really strong deck. I just think when people finally decided to start, you know, playing with it, it was a great call. Mm -hmm. I think it was like a challenge for these other decks to kind of deal with it at the time. And then if you also haven't played against Kenan a lot, just stay on top of it. Like, like anytime I see a Kenan, I respect it because I know what it can do. And I also playing against a lot of players who play these like these green Thrasios Kenan style decks with Seaborn Muse. They very much act like that they're not the threat. But <laughs> if you, you think about it, if you want to put it in like a sports term, they're basically like a team that controls the clock. By controlling the clock, they have their hand on the football more. In this game, they have more hands on in terms of like cardboard more. So they're going to just have greater options. Mm -hmm. that time equity of stealing off the clock they can kind of control the narration of if they got their seed muse online or the thrasios activation or the Kenan activation you know they get more time to make more choices take the choices away from their opponent you know whether it's actually a card mechanic that's doing it or just the actual actions of what the cards do and i think that's kind of important to decks that play like thrasios and Kenan especially but i think Kenan's a really solid deck i, I like it again great mox amber deck gets a lot of the cool explosive mana and it's not hard shut down by like uh like a collect roof effect because it still has all the dorks mm -hmm. so it can pivot one way or another depending on how the draws line up yeah pretty powerful option it's got seven top 16s this year with 44 entries leading to a 15.91 percent conversion rate kind of closer to that like blue farm range of conversion rate not too high, but still pretty good for what it's doing and uh, a decent number of entries. Again, I think kind of comedian push it and then also just like Tyler from play to win is just like a lot of people are going to see that and want to play the deck. And I think he also t top 16 was that last year, I think, or was that this year? I know he had to drop out of top 16 and go catch a flight. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Number seven. So this is the last deck with more than five top 16s. And then we're kind of zoomed through some of the other ones is Malcolm Tana with five top 16s out of 29 entries with 17% conversion rate. Kind of typical stats. This is a deck that kind of goes up and down in the format as creature removal is more of a thing that people are packing and just the level of respect that people have. I think the main thing that 
this has over some of the other Malcolm decks is the green creature tutors making the ways to get Glint Horn Buccaneer into play, having way more options to do that. And then also it kind of gives it a pivot plan where some of the decks, where they're on like Niv or something like that, they get access to different things that they can do. Kiki GT on those. Yes, yeah, Kiki. So yeah, just like a kind of consistent deck that if people respect it or if people don't respect it, can just steal wins out from under you. It's a little weird because it's a teamer deck, but it doesn't really play like a mid-range deck. It's another one people have been experimenting with, adding things like Final Fortune, mostly cutting Niv and other like dead cards and kind of trying to go more all in on their actual game plan, which is pretty strong and for the most part hard to interact with. I think that deck's a really solid choice, especially too if you're like a experience. And this this deck right here feels like one of those old school like legacy decks or like something like Canadian Threshold. Even though it's it's not a Delver deck, it feels kind of like a Delver deck in certain mm. ways, like a teamer teamer Delver list. And and of course, like Malcolm's really powerful. Like and then the command zone's very good. Uh, it's again a great jeweled lotus commander and then just you know you wouldn't think that the green card as as you know you see like green's typically not like considered very high but green cards that it does play do protect the combo very well and like autumn's veil vale and Vela summer those kind of cards it gets access to the green creature tutors that we discussed and it has like a wide variety of those so it has neoform which i think is a pretty powerful card it has neoform eldritch evolution finale of devastation we'll see if the new uh green green x a uh, card sees play in this deck since the tutors for glenhorn buccaneer good deck overall i like it i think it's solid it's not something I would sleeve up right now. I like having some form of like card advantage in the command zone. And and in some ways, Malcolm is that because Malcolm produces the mana and mana is another form of advantage that I think kind of gets, it's not inherent like physical cards in your hand, but it produces mm. the mana on the battlefield. So a really strong deck, really solid, very popularized by like certain people like Vasher and Al from playing with power. So kind of going through a bit of the rest of the top 10 that, have like kind of less results but rounded out we have five color sisse with light captain with four top 16s out of 15 entries 26.67 percent conversion rate pretty high conversion rate though it is kind of below that 20 threshold that i mentioned for entries so kind of low entry count really good toolbox deck this has been kind of popping up not a deck you necessarily think of as like a top 16 machine but has been popping up a lot this year already Tyvar really changed the whole deck's like yeah. dynamics a lot. Tyvar really strong commander for that list. Next, our first, I guess you'd say, dedicated stacks list, Rocco at number nine with four uh, out of 19 entries with a 21% conversion rate. Super flexible, fairly good colors for what you're trying to do with creature heavy stuff. You get the only good food chain commander, period. I said it. Uh, uh, so real quick, I, I look at the last chaos event. Uh, there were a lot of food chain decks in the That's top true. 16 in the last chaos event. Again, because I think people forgot about food chain and it just kind of went under the radar. And sometimes you just kind of blink and there's the food chain combo. So it is notable. A lot of what people didn't like about food chain was that it didn't win through rule of law. But you might notice there's not a lot of rule of law. If you take a look at even the top 20 here or something like there's there's not a lot of rule of law effects. And especially if you have a card like Rocco that can tutor for any part of the chain, you know, you can get Moonbless Cleric, put Food Chain on the deck. You can get your Squee, put it into play. You can get Grand Abolisher to protect it if you have it. Like having that much flexibility and also being an out, like being able to set up the combo and be the outlet for it is always very good. One thing about Rocco that it is a, it does have rule law on it, but it wins through two ways. It's deafening silence, which doesn't hurt it through the food chain combo. And then it runs Archon of Emeria, which is a rule of law effect, but it can remove its own rule of law effect. Yeah. Just like it can remove its own collector oof. So it gets to play the best stacks creatures while also being able to get rid of them. Which is really kind of what the old like Asaketh style like decks did. They were able to just play like collector oof and whatnot, but then get rid of the collector oof with the Rosaketh. Mm. and then still win with LED. So this is something that this deck uniquely gets to do. And then lastly, we've got Krom Tevish with three top 16s of 17 entries, 17% conversion rate. This is a pretty cool deck because it gets to do pretty similar thing to Rogsai. It gets to be like a turbo deck, but it has the advantage of like, you don't have to really run mid-range cards because you just have two super strong mid-range commanders. Tevish and Krom both are going to draw you a million cards. Tevish's ultimate isn't that easy to do, but it's not as hard as you think to do. And uh, if you get it, it 
probably wins the game. Good luck dealing with that. Um, and you just get to run a lot of the good stuff. You get to take advantage of Displacer Kitten uh, with Tevish, which works great. Just turn all your cards basically into like draw two or every other card draws to. And just lots of good Grixis stuff that is in a shell that doesn't necessarily just fall apart if it loses turn two or if it goes for something on turn two and gets, you know, punished for it. Notably, Spencer's List from Punt City 2 literally is uh, playing, it's playing 26 lands and it's playing the uh, trio of soul land effects in Ancient Tomb, City of Traders, and Phyrexian Tower. And it's basically because uh, the pilot spoke on this on camera after their win. They're using a lot of the way the rock side technology, the current rock side technology is kind of built into that. So they took their mid-range commanders, applied the speed capability along with the resiliency of the deck. And I think this deck is actually very good. Like if you don't want to play four colors and you just like that three color smoothness of your mana base, I think this deck is actually quite good. Quite good because it's a breach deck. It's got breach, Yogmoth's will. It's got Thassa's Oracle combo. It's probably more underrated despite its top performances lately. Like it's right there. Like I, th I mean, it's real. I mean, it's really hard. Like if I wanted, let's say, I just had the fear of not being able to um, take advantage of like Rogsai as a comparable pilot. This would be a like a softer deck to pivot into. Mm -hmm. Uh, but still also playing the power of it's got leave it. Yeah, it has a couple of time walk effects into it as well. So it's not just this set there, try to counter spell stuff like it's pretty aggressive. It's on defense grid. It's on skull clamp. So it's really trying to acquire resources and apply the pressure and close out a win as fast as possible while still having all the capability of controlling and pivoting a game. Yeah, this is a deck I think you get a couple really dedicated pilots on. We could see this move up because it, it was something people were experimenting with like when Commander Legends came out and then Armix kind of took some of the shine and then now everybody's just on Blue Farm if they're playing Krom. But this is definitely one to watch out for. And like you said, a really powerful list that is maybe a little bit less daunting than something like a Rog side because you just have so much ridiculous card advantage in the command zone and your resiliency is kind of like obvious to you as opposed to like some of the decision making you might have to make with a rock side or even blue farm for that matter just especially mm -hmm. like fetching and whatnot you know that that could get quite tedious if you don't if you're just like you know because you know our podcast is dedicated mostly to new players so if you're rolling in and you're just like hey do i play blue farm or do i play this deck you know, this is the deck that i would take uh i'll definitely take a couple looks at i mean i might sleeve it up myself you know yeah it looks pretty good we're going to end it with pointing out a couple of the big losers of this info. So there are some decks here that a lot of players or content creators might label as like fairly top tier. And again, this isn't necessarily a tier list. This is just the results we have this year. This doesn't indicate the power level of the deck. But with this many results, it should probably indicate something, whatever that is. We're looking at this deck here, which has only one top four placement out of 24 entries. Pretty substantial which is only a 4% conversion rate. And that is Malcolm Timna, which was kind of the hotness at the beginning of the year with a Silicon Dynasty win. A lot of people were talking up as to how strong as Pirates is, but that is the only top 16 placement it's had this year so far. Why that is, I don't know. Maybe lacking the red from Blue Farm just isn't quite worth getting the Malcolm. This is a Malcolm deck that doesn't have access to Glinthorn, so you don't have that combo malcolm is just there to kind of be a worse professional face breaker and so yeah maybe it's not quite as good it is a great timman attacker that flies but yeah i don't know what do you think the issue with malcolm timna is it's pretty hard to look at those results and i know the, the obviously the pilot who won they're they're a pretty they're a pretty good player but you know and it'd be different if it was like uh one win or one top 16 and like four people who you know signed up for it hmm. 24 this yeah, is the, I think the only deck is the only deck that has like there's one more deck that kind of gets to like outshine it. And I think what we're seeing is too is like the deck did really well. Probably more people signed up on it, more people got on it, and then realized that it might take a little bit more skill. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right word to use, but more patience, more understanding of the deck. It doesn't necessarily have some of the automatic like and I know this deck, to a lot of them, they play like Yogmoth's Will, but it's also kind of weird because it's on Graft Digger's Cage. So you're kind of, you know, back and forth on that. Tibbet's not on Yogmoth's Will. Yeah. They're just on Graft Digger's Cage. Relevantly, so Tibbet can just close out the game, you know. Yeah. 
It's also a doomsday deck, which can tend to be like a little scary and like it, it's something that new players can either shy away from or it, it can be really tough because doomsday is a card that in the same turn in the same position can like win you the game or lose you the game. It's a pretty all in card in what is kind of a mid rangey Esper shell. So there, yeah, there, there may be this is also the at least the one that won deck that chooses to run like laboratory maniac you got uh hate bears that you don't often see like even mind sensor demonic betrayal is a win con this is a nas deck it's also on gush which is pretty cool i think that's part of the doomsday pile yeah won a tournament and then the other results pretty rough after that and then along the same lines malcolm bile smasher right there with it one top 16 placement and then 20 entries total with only a 5% conversion rate. And if you didn't know any better, you would think Malcolm Vile Smasher was like... The best tech ever. <laughs> dominating these events. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's just people like think it's praises. And I just think it's... I've played the deck. And, you know, like a lot of these decks we've all played and experimented with. And I know there's like dedicated pilots to this. And those are the people that I would always lean to to get like expertise to. Uh, just mostly because they're probably going to be the ones that do better. And again, too... People that might do really well with decks also don't necessarily play in tournaments. You know, like I Definitely like, you no. Know, if you went down and saw how poorly kind of Corval does in the tournaments, uh, while it still has like a, several like people winning like with like two wins or something like that, going like two and three, mm. being like a win or a draw away from a top sixteen. And I'm not necessarily trying to say I'm the best Corval player out there, but I very much understand the decks, weaknesses, ends, and outs. And there's a lot of solid pilots out there, but none of those people actually play in the tournaments. So we might see, you know, the Clark Sakashima like pilots. You know, we're gonna we'll mm-hmm. just go ahead and touch up on Clark, and that's another deck that has like really poor conversion rate, and it could be due to the complexity of the deck time equity of the way the deck eats up the clock uh people shine like skilled pilots shying away from the deck there, there's a multitude of factors that go into it but you know like someone like ken when ken played clark he did quite well with clark and he won that event last mm. year but that's not to say that any of these decks it's not to ever tell you don't play these decks because i don't we don't believe in those philosophies at all but also at the same time you know we're again we're starting to see trends and some could turn right around and these decks could put up like some hell marys and like jump their percentages right up but it's yeah. also to kind of take a look at it too from a data perspective you see one conversion out of 24 entries that's pretty low yeah and then yeah, somebody dude. could say well it got the one and i'm like yeah but 24 entries that's that's pretty rough yeah you typically um, especially so like with malcolm timna when you're looking at a deck that wins a tournament that's usually meaning there's either some well i mean there's always going to be some luck involved but it's usually meaning there's some kind of consistency there to put up results throughout the whole day in a lot of different scenarios and and you're usually going to look at a deck that can put up a win as something that if a lot of other people are playing it is also going to be able to at least have decent results you know maybe like a couple extra top 16s again we can't really account for like the skill level of pilot on on any of these decks you know like and it's all like eric was talking about with Corvold, it's always safe to assume that there are very good magic players who are not showing up to events like we're not seeing a lot of hall of famers showing up to cdh events so clearly there are like really good people who could probably you know wipe the floor like you know we saw brian koval show up and he's two for two and there are magic players that he would consider much above himself it could be a skill thing it can be just like you know poor luck or poor positioning again when you have a malcolm deck win a tournament and then you see a Malcolm deck at your table, you might be a little more likely to kind of hate that player out of the game or just really respect them or maybe over respect them and make it a little bit tougher on them. Malcolm Bile Smasher, though, I really expected to be higher based on the way that people talk about this deck, especially like people who weren't as high on Rogsai, which is way outperforming this deck. And this is one that does have access to the Glinthorn combo, although it doesn't have creature tutors. Yeah, I, I kind of expected this one to be a little bit higher. I was a bit surprised, but it also I, I could see like a really good Grixis pilot coming in and getting a win with it at some point. I don't think the deck is inherently weak. It's in great colors and it's got at least one good commander. Yeah, one good commander. And also, too, when you look at like Grixis Malcolm, its win conditions are pretty wild. You have Breach, you have Thassa's Oracle, and you have Glenhorn Buccaneer. That's 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 really powerful in like mm-hmm. what the deck could do. Obviously, it's going to have access to Rhystic and Mystic and that type of stuff. It has Breach lines, but the deck, I don't know. I, I, there's something about playing Malcolm. I think we also saw this with like the Esper deck, but the Esper deck gets to rely on Timna. Yeah. So like, let's just say for this hypothetical situation, 
The Vile Smasher is has ten minutes abilities. Which deck's better? Probably the Grixis list by mm. like a long shot because it already is the inherently more powerful colors. White's really good. Don't let people fool you. It's really really good. Like, but the thing about where the and you see the deck that does perform better. It's the Malcolm Tana list mm. with you know like one of the worst partners. You know, though Tana does serve a purpose. A fairly limited win cons like, relative to the black decks. But what it does the most consistently, it gets its Malcolm out, and it has the ability to just you know, put Malcolm out and get Glenhorn Buccaneer. Mm-hmm. If that's what the deck's trying to do, it's not trying to do anything fancy. It's not trying to breach or anything like that, though. I think there would be a kind of a cool list that I've worked on where there's like a Malcolm list that has like a backup breach line mm-hmm. because it gets to do certain things, which is kind of neat. But that's that's for another day. I do want to pivot real quick into just two decks and, we'll, and we can wrap up this that kind of fall in favor. And really, if you dive into this, there's quite a bit of it. One's going to be Gracios Temna, which TNT, there's different flavors of TNT, which you would think that like TNT, it's like Thracios Temna. How can this be bad? But it is really dropped in terms of its performance. It only has three conversions, 25 entries at 12%. Mm-hmm. Now, is that indicative of deck being good bad not the right pilots again there's a lot that goes into it i think anytime you would have somebody like you know spleen or uh sick robot roll up with this deck you would 100 percent not only respect the deck but you'd respect the pilot as well because they know these type of decks in and out and this isn't to discredit anybody else who plays the deck these are just the first two people i think of when it comes to this mm. So, again, this deck suffers from different flavors, different variations. I don't know which versions these are unless I went through the list completely. Yeah, I think I've talked to people who also agree that it probably, looking at the commander pairing at least, should be doing pretty well when you look at the other decks that tend to be doing well in this like pretty grindy environment. It actually, in the command zone, it's got the two best grindy cards that you could ask for, really. I think that there might be a lack of... Like we had mentioned, there's, there's not a lot of, at least that I'm aware of, people trying to really innovate with Timnathrasios. Red is really good. You need good reasons not to be playing red and also getting access. Like you look at the decks that aren't red that are doing well are things like Tivit, which has one of the few, I think, advantage engines in the command zone that's better than Timnathrasios, as well as like having a one card win condition and being able to hate out things that all the things Timnathrasios wants to do, like getting to run Graphics Cage. You're not going to get to run that Timna Thrasio, so you just turn off your deck. So I think the, the lack of red, and then again, I think to some people, like a deck being boring is enough to not have it do well because a lot of people aren't going to be excited to play it. And this is a deck that has historically, I'm absolutely certain, the highest number of top 16s in like the history of ZDH because it used to do extremely well. So now it's, um, and again, it's not doing horribly at 320 with 25 12% conversion rate isn't you know terrible compared to like blue farm but then you look at the same colors in a track so with nine entries has three top 16 placements already does that mean a tracks is better than thrasios timna maybe not but people are looking at it with new eyes because it's a new deck there's probably going to be more excitement to play a deck like that with a hot new commander than maybe like a thrasios and timna yeah, and and two, I really think the the versions that you decide to play on is like how does the deck close the game out? So mm-hmm. also, so any kind of Demir deck aside of Thoth's Oracle combo, how does the deck close the? How does it get to that point? How does it close it out? So there was the Sacred Guide version, which was basically Sultai with Sacred Guide at Sands White, and I know that deck kind of put up some results for a little bit, but there's no way I'm rolling up to a tournament not playing like Ranger Captain of Eos or Esper Sentinel. Mm. George to plowshares, those cards that the whole point of playing that, unless you just think Sultai is literally that good. But the one thing I've noticed about this deck is like, what does it attack with? Anadorks? You know, yeah, like it's, it's got it's very weird. It's there's a lot of pressure points in the deck. It's got like the Grand Abolishers, the you know, a lot of the same cards that are in blue farm, but the one thing that it doesn't do, it doesn't have Krom. Mm-hmm. So it might have Timna, but like Thrasios really isn't attacking very often. Yeah. Thrasios is kind of blocking or just chilling. Krom literally applies pressure to the battlefield. So not only does Krom draw you cards, it's also applying pressure. So it's one of those things that really takes advantage of the inherent nature of red that's kind of never discussed is that ability to, while you're you're playing this four-color pile, but it's really applying a lot of pressure or it's really hard to attack into. 
that's, I think, the difference. It's, you know, you've got to be really surgical, I think, with this list. And I think the ones that play like the Fiend Artisan and mm. um, it was the re- it was the one that fortunately not in this one, but it was the one that the Brian Koval first one is that this deck was in the top 16, I believe. And yeah. the Fiend Artisan is just basically tutoring for a win almost every time. Mm. I think if you get a dedicated pilot that plays something, a deck like that, again, does really well. But also at the same time as we see this deck is on a bunch of creatures. We're getting to the point to where people are starting to play more sweepers. Yeah. And unless those creatures like you know, if you just lose your whole board, you just lost your whole engine. It's not like that, you know, you've got a bunch of treasures or anything off of these creatures prior to or you don't have Dockside to get you back into the game. Some of these cards take delayed. And I just don't think Razakath is where you want to be in the format currently, personally. Yeah. I think there's a misconception that Thassa's Oracle is the best win con when it's actually Breach. And so being like a four color pile that doesn't do Breach, I think sucks. But yeah, Thrust of Stimma, that, that deck is specifically one of the strengths of it is we've seen like Hermit Druid and like you mentioned, Fiend Artist and decks do this is being creature win cons, which is another strength of like Malcolm Tana, that other deck that's doing well. Yeah, I think there's maybe just a lot of like division and also just like a deck with this much history is going to have like a lot of like baggage that comes with it in terms of like how you approach deck building just before you've even like instead of approaching it as a new deck you're thinking it in the context of like the history of Thrasios Temna. I definitely think there's like a 98 that's maybe like fairly different from what we normally see that maybe is able to attack the format from a different angle because like Red is great, but like not having red clearly doesn't mean that you can't be like a top contender. Yeah, I definitely think there's there's potential for it. And again, like we said, it's it's one of the best performing decks historically. So I I think it's safe to say that at some point it can probably turn around, especially you get some dedicated pilots. Now we get to do what we really want to do, and that is beat up on our last deck. (laughs) That is an (laughs) underperformer. We're going to talk about everyone's favorite deck, Tyam. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> so Tyam has been popping up recently. I, I'd like to, you know. Green 12. Not, uh, I'm telling you, uh, Tyvar is really, and that's, re- and real quick to piggyback off what we were talking about. I think Tyvar is where, if you're going to play Hermit Druid, I think Tyvar is just a great card because, and I don't know the list. I've messed around with it in Atraxa. Tyvar cuts on your Divining Witch. It, if you did want to go, I think Sacred Guide, it has to tap. I'm not sure. I can't remember the text on the card, but in it's terms like of Hermit tap Druid. Tap and pay a white, I think, on Sacred Guide. Okay, perfect. So Tyvar does exactly what you need to do. It, you know, it, it has that ability. So just Tyvar, explore Tyvar with that list. But uh, no, we're going to talk about Winona. If you were to take a look at the last probably year, most people would put Winona in their top four decks, if not like easily top 10, top five yep. uh, in CDH. We've talked about it a lot. We think it's the most powerful overall like stacks deck in the format. And I don't think the numbers support it. And there's like, I, I want to put like two caveats here. It's kind of tough because like we know like there's really good pilots who play it. And, you know, they typically do really well with the list. But I think where Winona suffers, and before I get into that, it's it's got two conversions just this year in top 16 with 34 entries. And it has a 5.88% conversion rate. That's pretty low. Yeah. It's pretty low for the number of entries. Whether it's all 34 people just not knowing how to mulligan or, you know... What does that look like? There's so many factors going. I think the thing with Winona is it's more of a specialist deck and just a broad overall deck. Mm-hmm. And I think like Mike Sad's recent result with it, I don't know if you've taken a look at the list, but it has a lot more interaction. Yep. Which I think is what made that deck quite, quite good and very viable. Just like most people look at a card like Orem's Chant, for example, and not think that it's like very good. But in that deck, Orem's Chant is quite good. It's almost like just a counter spell mm. in a lot of ways. And kudos to Mike. And then obviously Comedian's done a ton of work on Winona and just you know, help put that deck on the map and crushed with it before. But it's an interesting puzzle because to me, if I see it at the table, I 100% respect the deck, especially to, for some reason, that deck always has like a turn one or turn two Winona and a Dranith Magistrate. <laughs> and it's mm. just running away with the game. You wouldn't think Ornithopter is powerful, but when they go turn one Winona with an Ornithopter, you very much go, we might be in trouble here. What do you think, Matt? What do you think? What do you think's going on with Winona here? Numbers wise. So yeah, it's the, I believe, sixth most submitted deck of tournaments this year so a pretty relevant number i I definitely 
34. That is enough representation for me to say that these numbers mean something. I do think it's pretty relevant that one of the two placements and the only one that was a top four, I believe, was with a list trying out a lot of new cards that make the deck a little less fragile and just more interactive in general. I think the deck inspires a lot of uh, how do I put this in a Lamoris cards friendly way? A lot of false confidence or I don't know, just it's a deck that can really carry you in pods that don't respect you or in environments where things aren't exactly like a tournament setting, right? So I think a new person can pick up Winota and play with some people who are just kind of hanging out and play and just body everybody and feel like this is unbeatable. This is my deck. This is what I'm playing. And I think, like you said, it really is more of a specialist deck. And we even saw, you know, Ian really unhappy with the way that he was targeted in Punt City 2, where he dropped from the tournament O oh, and something. I believe, because what he thought was people overreacting to the deck, but it's a deck that represents an unknown threat and unknown threats are way scarier to people than known threats, I think, because you, you've got to think about like, yeah, for you, like as a Winota pilot, oh, well, it's only one trigger. But if somebody's holding up Swan Song and Swords to Plowshares is their interaction and they see that you're about to flip and, you know, they've got a Tundra out, you have the option to flip into like a, a Magist of the Moon to turn off their land or a sanctum prelate to turn off their one mana spells you just like can c cut them off the game like sure you could also just whiff but they don't know that you're gonna whiff and they have to interact before that starts to happen so i think winota draws a lot of negative attention to herself i think if you try to play her like a turbo deck has the weakness of turbo decks right now which aren't tending to do well you don't see a lot of them get top fours or super high turnover without some like we mentioned Roxy, a turbo deck that has had to kind of like adapt itself to to function right now to, to do as well as it has and but that it just plays counter spells like yeah it you gets know, blue it blue cards winota a not a great deck at preventing itself from losing like if if someone goes for a turn one or turn two win you can't not often like sometimes you got the red blast in your hand so there's like that aspect of it and people will just hate you out of the game because kind of like how a bunch of Mid-range pilots will bully a turbo player out of the game. A bunch of mid-range players don't want the one person who has the most powerful value engine in the game. They don't want them to do anything. So they'll bully them too because you're not going to be able to stop it. Or a bunch of turbo players. Like turbo players will be force of willing your Winota because you know one or two, just a Thalia is enough to mess with them. And not even to mention like, a uh, rule of law effect like an archon of Amira getting to come down like they don't want you to do your thing nobody in the format wants you to do your thing because if you do you're not going to be beaten so you have to really adapt to that and i think we'll see if winota is able to or not clearly the commander is super powerful even though it is in limited colors but it might just be like a retooling like what mike said i mean he was one game away from winning a tournament with her so definitely I, th I think the deck still has legs but i think it's worth noting and we're saying this while a lot of people think the deck is like top five potential but it is third worst conversion rate here of, you know, of decks with a lot of play to them so obviously still strong commander but you should definitely look at these stats and know hey if i bring this to a tournament odds are i'm not <laughs> i'm not making it to top 16 if i'm just I hoping it's going to carry me that's not likely to happen too, I think that's also where like people are starting to because we saw that like Kennen and Winona kind of drop at the same time a little bit was this is just from the uh, results we're looking at. You, know, you might be tearing up your locals with like Winona and Kennen and those type of that. And, and then what we're talking about is just doesn't apply to you. Yeah, but we're just kind of looking at it as a broad perspective. And that's again, people trying to respect a little bit more for creatures and as the format progressive and there's more tournaments and there's more competitive players mulliganing correctly mulliganing for their pod understanding because all these numbers are going to change in punt city too we watched connor keep a non-turbo dargo hand but they kept a calling ritual because winona was in the pod mm -hmm. and because of how powerful that card is against that deck and when they resolved that card you know they were able to just basically clear the board outside of blue farm stuff uh you know an unfortunate vampiric tutor with a crom trigger to draw the deflecting swat but like you know understanding like you know playing these kind of board wipes that are really powerful against these things because it's not necessarily inherently the winona it's what winona flips into so yeah 
if you can play these cards, these sweepers or these, you know, toxic deluges, the fire covenants, the dams, uh, cyclonic risks of the world, you know, those cards are really good against these creature strategies, especially ones that like the ones that aren't blue removal. And Winona has a really hard time, like it, it, you know, unless they're playing to bolt trickery, they're not countering those cards I just mentioned. Mm. So. You know, just something to look forward to and understanding, you know, your limitations with your deck. Don't ever let that discourage you from playing the deck. I'm playing a non-blue deck right now that inherently doesn't have a lot of great term results in the States per se. But, you know, it's still what I enjoy and it's a great puzzle to solve. I do want to mention real quick with Winota that it's always been relevant to me. One thing I, I noticed when doing Learn to Play was it was the deck that by name was mentioned in almost every single video when I asked people about matchups. And I think that's really relevant because it means that people are thinking about your deck and how to specifically beat it. And you have a game plan, which I think a lot of the decks higher up, like, you know, uh, Blue Farm, Najila, Dawn Waker to an extent, Tivit, blah, blah, blah. You have a game plan that is fairly easy to disrupt and is fairly linear without a lot of ability to pivot. If I knew my pod was full of like Blue Farm, Najila, Bruce Tarl or whatever, there's not a lot of cards I can bring that counter just good stuff playing good stuff piles like because there's not a lot of ways to deal with it you know i can bring like nar sets or smothering ties or stuff to deal with draw or you know um curse totem effects to deal with the, the mana dorks it's harder to counter that game plan than it is to counter winota's which is just hey make sure you have enough creature removal and make sure winota doesn't trigger you know you know when that's going to happen you know when you need to interact and if people keep seeing your deck a lot and it has a relatively linear way that it looks to win without a lot of ways to pivot you have to know that people are going to take advantage of that because they're going to get sick and tired of losing to you and we saw like brian talk about like i'm I'm not going to lose to a nota i don't want to lose to a nota they bring in cards like containment priest specifically not to and all this removal because and maybe that's it's the the reality is that if everybody's prepared for Winota, it's not a good deck anymore unless there's like pretty intensive changes that happen to the way that it tries to win the game yeah, and I think that's one of those decks that it allows to ebb and flow into the format. So you've seen this before in, in other constructed formats. There's like decks that kind of fall off the radar and then people just forget about them and then they take removal out. They're back into a yeah. different space and then first time they do that, they look at it and then bang. Yeah, like if it, it comes in and just slaughters everybody. If you see like Rogsai wins like two or three tournaments this year and like gets a bunch more tops and then that's what people are scared of. Their, you know, Chain of Vapor and Source of Plashers looks pretty worthless against decks like that if they're the main thing. And so, yeah, it wouldn't be surprising at all to see like a Krark deck or Winota just show up and take advantage of the lack of creature removal. Yeah, and that's not to say these like decks can't win. And I don't ever want to like ever say that, but like it's much harder for Krark to win if Krark isn't on the battlefield yeah. or if an end's not on the battlefield. Like Blue Farm, while it's great, if the commanders are on the battlefield, they can still just win without their commanders. Mm -hmm. You know, these decks that have these A plus Bs or these powerful like cards like an ad nauseum or even just intuition can just get them back back in the game because they all got to do is resolve the intuition protect the underworld breach and they're going to win more likely than not while like these decks don't necessarily have that plan they don't have those ability to do that doesn't inherently make them like worse it's just something to consider when they don't necessarily just have those other optimal powerful plays Absolutely. And I mean, we even saw in like, I think it was in Swiss, but in uh, Punt City too, like we saw like a turn one win happen. That's not something that a Krark deck or like Winota is typically going to be able to do. And like having that, that is part of your, of course, turn one wins are a bit of a stretch, they're not too likely, but even like a turn two or a turn three win for a, a deck like Winota or Krark that are in colors that don't really lend themselves to very quick compact wins. That's like a weakness of your deck. And your deck relying on something sitting on the board that people are ready for. That's just something you got to think of. And again, like you, you got to be ready for those sort, sort of things. And if you're not, you can't say that it's that you're poorly positioned when you're not trying to adapt to that type of stuff. But yeah, we couldn't go fully throughout the entire list. That might be a, a bit much, but if you found this interesting. If you'd like to hear more about our thoughts on the position of the format right now, let us know. Uh, we could definitely make this like a quarterly sort of update that we do 
where we talk about the results that have happened, our general thoughts on, you know, what people are saying about certain decks or content or whatever's happening in the format. If you enjoyed this, let us know in the comments what you liked, what you didn't like. Subscribe on YouTube, follow us over on Spotify, consider supporting us on Patreon, buying some merch, telling us we did a good job, all that good stuff. And um, yeah, this has been Learning CDH. Hopefully you learned something new. Uh, and again, thank you to Eminence for providing this info, which made my life so much easier in making this. And uh, hopefully you'll have access to this information sometime soon. Again, appreciate everybody who listens, watches. We appreciate the support. And we're just trying to help make the format better and get resources to people who need it. Absolutely. This has been Learning CDH. Thanks for listening. Go play CDH.